team has to come up with a great commercial for a terrible product. It would be helpful if you had some kind of notepad or typed notes into your chat function or some kind of on-screen notepad. First mate, you can pause here if people need to get equipped. Now, everyone's equipped, and everyone think of one terrible product that you think you could come up with for a commercial, like for delivering a baby at home, a tiny tot toilet plunger, or a shop vacuum. Can you think of one, a bad product? There's no pressure. Confess the stress. What would be a terrible product for you to have to sell? Does it make you tense to be thinking? Did your mind turn into a turnip? Relax. Confess the stress. If you wish, you can pick up from, from a list uh, or, or the first mate can assign you something to guarantee that there will be variety. Either way, you have 60 seconds to choose the product or to be assigned. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good. You have all picked a product. The first mate will soon assign breakout room pairs, and you and your partner will have five minutes to choose one of the two candidates and then come up with your convincing commercial for a terrible product. First, one or both of you have to make the fake product because you can only have it on one camera or you can both try it at each end. The worst you could do would be a sketch of it, which would work. So right now, first jot down or print screen these four steps to creating a commercial. Number one, what is the problem that the product will solve? Number two, what is the solution the product offers? Number three, what does it actually do? And number four, three great benefits. Then one of you names a price and the other names the website, www.whatever.com. So, each of you two will take two of the four selling points to present. And smile! Sell it! Use your hands a lot. Make it sound like, like it's entirely believable and delightful. First mate, when you bring everyone back from breakout rooms, then each one will present. And then all will vote on the top two commercials. You can end my video here and put pairs into five-minute breakout rooms. First mate has the helm. Go sell that product, baby. <laughs> the challenge right now is called Little Things. You're going to be sent on a mission to find a little thing, something that is worthless, but also priceless to you. Any object that you were given, you found, you received, you have kept, even though you couldn't get a buck for it at a garage sale. For me, it's an old toffee tin that became a cookie tin my mother would send me with fresh baked Christmas cookies when I returned to California to work in the theater. So go around your house and find an object you could hold in your hand that is worthless 
and yet priceless. Some of you are, are panicking, uh, but my story isn't interesting. I don't have anything interesting. I'm not interesting. Confess the stress and think. We're going to give you two minutes to do this at the max. If you come back early, if everyone comes back early, then the, the uh, host, the first mate, can right away start off on people sharing their, their object, their little thing, and their story. But if you are still panicking, and you walk around your house and you can't think of anything, consider your purse. Consider the, the little stubs of paper and cards in your wallet that will hold a story. Consider your keychain. Your keychain might have a little fob on it from a trip you took a long time ago. And you may even have keys on your keychain that no longer work, but you just don't want to let go of them. Same thing for what's in your purse, what's in your wallet. There might be a photo in your wallet of somebody from long ago that you just, just can't get rid of it. But whatever object you find in your house or your office, it should essentially be worthless to the world and priceless to you. Because these objects hold a power and a memory. They hold a story. Good hunting. You have a two whole minutes. So let your mind go to work. Recap, your ship is sinking rapidly. When I next blow the bosun's whistle, you must quickly scrounge things from your home or office that can help your crew be found and rescued, and collect things to help you survive until you are rescued, or everyone in the lifeboat will perish. Rules. You are accepting full responsibility for your own safety, so do not run. Anyone who hurts themselves may become shark bait. Tips. This part of the ocean is very hot in the day and very cold at night. And another tip, there are always plenty of fish in the sea. I repeat, you are scavenging for things to help you get found and things to help you survive. Near the end of the two minutes, I will count down the final seconds for you to wrap up and get back on camera. If you do not get back here on camera within two minutes with your haul, you cannot get on the lifeboat. The lifeboat will have left without you. On your marks, get set, 
You have two minutes. What are you waiting for? Scavenge. You have one minute left. One minute. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <whistles> Cast off the lifeboat. Was there anyone who was not on camera at the whistle? That would be unfortunate. The boat has left without them. However, the crew can decide to turn the boat around and come get them. The crew can extend grace to the individual. I hope that everyone can remember a time when somebody extended grace to you, when someone rescued you. Vote. Show of hands for life-saving. All in favor? Motion is carried. Now, if anyone did miss the boat and is getting rescued, you do, should not get um, sentimental. The crew likes you, but they realize you have supplies that they can use, including perhaps a dinner. You would be the first to get eaten. So what was that Equip the Lifeboat challenge really about? Partly it's rediscovering that when we feel pressure, our brains can turn to porridge. While foraging, many of you might have felt some stress, some time pressure. And life is full of time pressures and deadlines, but we each can decide how we're going to respond to pressure. Some people handle it easily. I don't. But something I learned as a submariner, when I was literally under great pressure, it was to identify stress, to confess the stress. I learned to say out loud, I'm feeling stressed. When we acknowledge pressure, when we confess our stress, we aren't so quick to project that stress on others. A little pause here while any member of the crew can share how they handled the two-minute time pressure. I mean, was it easy or was it crazy? Did you like the pressure? You can always say pass, but here's a chance for an optional discussion. The challenge ends with the show and tell. If you want to play the trio team building game, which is called Man the Lifeboat 2, it requires all the items you just brought on camera now. So this part two should be played the same session. My name is Dennis Hassel. I am your captain, if that wasn't obvious. We're going to do party hats. You're going to be sent on a mission soon. Because when I was working for a non-profit organization, 
we decided that at every meeting, every meeting, board meetings, production meetings, planning meetings, at every meeting, it would be an excuse for a party. It worked so well, it was so productive, that we tried it at our church. It was so working well and productive and fun uh, that we decided that uh, we would try it in classrooms. And it worked so well. Every meeting can be an excuse for a party and get your work done better than before. So we are going to take on a party hat. We're going to wear our party hat when we meet. So I want to send you on your challenge, which is in 60 seconds, to find a party hat that is not a hat. You have to transform something into your party hat. It could be very simple, like a, a piece of cardboard. Now, now this is uh, what they used to call a folder in the days of paper in offices. Well, if you're in an office and not at home right now, you take one of these, cut it into an asterisk shape, and you've created a crown that will hold the, uh, the hat in place while you're wearing it, a very adjustable sized hat. Or you could make something uh, like from newspaper, you could make the old sailor's hat that, uh, that my grandfather taught me. Uh, I don't know if some of you even know what newspapers are anymore, but uh, we used to make pointed hats out of those as well. So find anything. You could even fall back on the bees, which is bags and baskets and bowls and boxes. All kinds of ideas. Your party hat cannot be a regular hat. Maybe you have an old book with laces long enough you can tie under your chin. Find something with a story, something you can wear proudly as your hat. And afterwards, you'll explain it to the others, uh, whether your story is short or long, for the hat that you have made that is not a hat, but it is a party hat for our purposes. So you have one minute, and come back with your hat. Everyone has their hats. Now, in a big group or in uh, breakout rooms of, say, five or more, tell the story of your hat and how you got it and where you made it. It may be a very short story. It may be an object that has a little bit of a story behind it. Or maybe you fashion something. But when people see it, they may have questions. Enjoy. You're in the hands of the first mate, and you have a few minutes uh, to... Share the story of your hats before you go to the next challenge. Is this better? Is this more uh, admiralty? This is the 50th challenge. So we are going to go back to our premise of you being all in the same boat and being one crew together. Today, I am not going to be the captain. I am going to be a crew member like you. The point of this challenge is to do something all together in unison. Have you ever seen athletes at the Olympics rowing their, their eight-man boats, their four-man boats? It's all about working together in a rhythm. Sailors chant and sing while they work because it's enjoyable but also because the rhythm ensures the whole crew is literally pulling together. So everybody, please stand up and clear a space at least six feet back from in front of your camera and at least six feet wide. 
That'll show more of your body at a distance because you're all going to be doing the same thing. So don't worry about what other people are doing. They're not watching you. They're worried with their own stuff, all right? Now, the reason that I'm demonstrating how the dance goes is not because I'm a dancer. It's because I am not a dancer. It's so that anybody watching this says, well, pff, if he can do it, I could give it a crack. I'm going to teach you the three parts of the song. And if you want to do your camera off or your video off for now, that's fine. It's really, really simple. Don't overthink it. Listen to the music and your feet will follow and your body will follow. And soon, if you get to run it a few times, more, maybe more than uh, one session, uh, you'll be able to do it all together. It'll make a great video capture of everyone in gallery all moving together as one. It's a great team building uh, project or challenge. So the first part is the verse. It's a very simple move. They're rowing. Now, when you row, you put your fists together, that's the uh, handles of the oar, lunge forward on one leg and punch. And you're punching low, or punching straight out, not high. So you go and punch, and then pull up and lean back. Then you can lunge forward with the other foot and punch and pull back. You do this three times, that's the first three lines of every verse. That's all you have to do. Lunge with your fists together, then raise them up and pull back. That's You've got the handles, the blades of the R in the water when you go up and then you pull. You've got to sell it. Punch, effort. All right. You can see that I'm traveling about four feet, well, three feet to do that. Fist together, punch, lift up and pull. That's the first three verses. Sorry, the first three lines of each verse. The fourth line is how you turn a boat around. One oar is going forward and the other one is pushing back. So it's like this. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, practice with me, and then reverse row, four. Blow my bully boys, blow. Then we go into the chorus. The chorus is also very simple. The chorus is simply pulling out a rope to your left. Soon may the Wellerman and a big pull down come to give us sugar and tea and, do you know the song? Rum. Pull it down. And then center, look at the camera. Then when the tonguing is done. So that's three. Left, right, center. Well, my left, right, center. You guys figure out which way you want to start so you're all in sync. But the last one is, we'll take our leave and go. Now the leave is also a keg. So you're going to take the keg, take our leave, bend with your knees, and throw it up to the next man. So you're bringing it down and you're throwing it up. We'll take our leave and go. Da, 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 da. We'll take our leave and go. That's the last line of the chorus. So the chorus goes like this. Da, 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 da. Da, da 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 and tea and rum. Then when the, what is it that's done? Then when the tongue is done, huh, we'll take our bend your knees, leave, and go. So let's all this, let's do all this together. It's actually easier to sing along with the words. <clears throat> Soon may the wellman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. Then when the tonguing is done, we'll Take our leave and go. That's the chorus. The last part is the little sea shanty dance when they're just singing da 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 just goes on and on. And look, nobody's gonna see your feet, so it doesn't have to be exact. It's like a polka. You're sort of doing a one, two, three when you're polka, but you can almost just bounce along and sell it. I've been in theater a very long time and selling the, the fun of the song and the joy of the song is what people are going to enjoy and what you will enjoy is having fun. I hate to break it to you, but people aren't watching you anyway, so you don't need to be self-conscious. You're important as a team, as a crew. So we're going to slow it down and uh, you will soon be better than I am at this. So you get through the second chorus and you do the little dance. Hands here and we're going to do a strength move on the last beat of each phrase. So here we go. Da 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 um da 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 um da 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 da
Walsh. It's always going back to the verse. It would be great when you reach for the rope if you can reach right out of camera pull. Go to your right. Out of camera pull. Center. Out of camera pull. Take your leave and go. Throw that keg up to the other hands. Right? So now you've got the four moves. Verses. The last verse, of course, is this. I'm sorry, the last line of the verse is this. So it's push, row, push, pull, push, pull. Turn around, turn around, and then left and right for the chorus and center, and take your leave and go. And the dance is forward, strength, 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 turn, two, three. Listen, you don't have to go by me. I, I guarantee you, if you close your eyes, you'll do better than I am because you'll be hearing the music and you won't, be, you won't have your monitor turned up too high. When we do things out of our comfort zone, we're so self-conscious, our monitor is so loud, it picks up everything and puts it out of proportion. We're going to need everybody, maybe the second time through, turn on the cameras. And, and uh, I'm thinking, when you get good at it, you can give permission to the first mate to record it because all of you will be moving together as one. There once was a ship that put to sea The name of the ship was a bully of tea The winds blew up her bow up down Oh below my bully boys blow <gasps> Soon may the willow man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tonguing is done We'll take our leave and go She'd not been two weeks from shore When down on her a right whale bore The captain called all hands and swore He'd take that whale in tow <laughs> Soon may the willow man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tonguing is done We'll take our leave and go da 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 before the boat had hit the water, the whale's sail came up and caught her. Hands to the side, harpooned and fought her when she dived down low. <laughs> Soon may the willow man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. No line was cut, no whale was freed. The captain's mind was not of greed, and he belonged to the whaleman's creed. She took that ship in tow. <laughs> Soon may the willow man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Da 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 for forty days or even more The lane went slack and tight once more All boats were lost, there were only four But still that will did go <gasps> Soon may the willow man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tonguing is done We'll take our leave and go as far as I've heard, the fight's still on The line's not cut and the whale's not gone The willow man makes his regular call To encourage the captain, crew and all Soon may the willow man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tonguing is done We'll take our leave and go Soon may the willow man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tonguing is done We'll take our leave and go They said it was going to be a warm-up. It's a workout. <laughs> well, you wait to be rescued. You need to practice your job hunting skills for the time when you're back on land. So we're going to do that by role-playing job interviews. 
Volunteers will be put in groups of three or four on screen in gallery, one group at a time. And each of you in turn will answer interview questions from the first mate for this made up job. There'll be two or more questions as time allows. You have a maximum of 30 seconds to answer each question. Game. One approach is to ingeniously tie your real life skills and experience and aptitude to this job description. The other version is to lie as believably as possible. We find that teenagers are horrifyingly good at lying brilliantly. And there's a twist. The first mate can shorten each answer period from 30 seconds to just 15. Your questions that you get, the order of the questions won't change. The first mate will ask as many questions for every candidate as time allows. And here are the questions that the first mate will ask. You'll have to answer each in 15 or 30 seconds. What in your broad life experience makes you the best candidate? What specific training and jobs have you had that provide you with relevant skills? What outside the box innovations would you propose for this work? What are your greatest strengths that apply to this job? Finally, what is your greatest weakness if you were to do this job and how would you cope? The first mate ideally has screen grabbed and printed off the list of job descriptions that are at the end of this video. The first mate will choose the straight or the fantastical version for you to play and everyone will vote on the best applicant in each group. You could elect to have the top players face off in a round of 15 seconds per answer in a new job title. Good hunting. Get that job. This challenge is Dreamwalk. It is not a challenge to do with people you are not already friends with. It is not an icebreaker. Now, Dreamwalk is the challenge for those who are strong enough to look inwards, wise enough to listen to others, brave enough to share with others, and for those who want to laugh their heads off. Jacob Barnett has autism. Jacob also became a working theoretical physicist. At the age of 10, Jake said, your IQ does not determine your contribution. How much time you take to simply think, to just think, to only think, will determine your success. So let me ask you, how much dedicated time do you take to just think about yourself, your behavior, your fears, your dreams? Dreamwalk is a challenge of guided introspection, sharing afterwards some small discoveries. This activity is not for people under the age of 21, and that's not because of any sexual content. It's because young people generally are too suggestible and often too malleable in their identity. And adults need to know that you do not have to share anything you don't want to share with anyone. Lifeboat is a safe place. As always, you can say pass, but as always, we say, as we pledged, what happened in the lifeboat stays in the lifeboat. The dream walk ends with discussion group. If you have more than eight and time is a factor, I suggest you divide up into breakup rooms of four or so. Now, what this is, is a guided meditation. It doesn't get spooky. It doesn't get weird. Everybody, just turn your video off, mute your microphone, and close your eyes. And relax by focusing on your breathing. Breathe. Breathe deep and slow. Four seconds in. Two, three, four. Out. Two, three, four. In. Two, three, four. Out. Two, three, four. 
in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Continue steady breathing. And now roll your shoulders in big circles. Lift them up, roll them back, roll them down, roll them forward, and back up again. Three more rolls. Breathe in the quiet, breathe out the stress. Confess the stress. Open your hands as if you're letting go of all your preoccupations and all your worries. They'll still be there when you come back from your dream walk. You're just taking a break. <laughs> you are daydreaming. You are in a safe place. In your dream walk, you cannot die. You cannot even be hurt or injured. It's just a dream. Whatever happens, whatever you do, it's okay. It's just a dream. So imagine yourself walking on a path in a meadow by a forest. It's sunny out and warm. On the path ahead, you see at a distance a key. You walk up to the key on the ground. What does the key look like? What size? What color? What kind of metal? What purpose does this key seem to serve? What does it look like it might open? Take a mental picture of the key. Pick up that key, put it in your pocket, and continue. The path turns towards the forest. Quite far ahead on the path, you see a tiger. The tiger does not see you. It makes no sense to find a tiger in a forest, but it's a dream. Anything can happen. So you have to continue forward. So there's a tiger a couple hundred feet ahead of you. So what do you do? You can do anything. And what does the tiger do in your dream, your safe dream. Now the tiger lopes off across the meadow and you take the path opposite it into the forest of tall trees, a forest that is lit with large sunny patches. It's warm. As you take the trail deep into the forest, you come across a house in the forest. What is the house that you see? Describe it in your mind. Is it a, a grand house or a modest house? Is it big? Is it small? Is it modern? Or is it a traditional house? Does your house look occupied or does it look deserted? I mean, are there flower boxes with flowers or are the windows broken? Is smoke curling up from the chimney? Or is the fire dead and shingles missing? Is the front door open or closed? Take a snapshot of your house in your mind. Remember what it looks like. And you head farther down the path. You make a few turns and then through the woods you can see water flashing through the leaves of bushes. The path takes you to the edge of a small lake. There is no sign of people or development on this lake. It's like you were the first person to ever discover this lake. You're standing on a small sandy beach. You put your hand in the water and the clear water is warm. What do you do? And how do you feel? And how long do you stay? I'm going to be in silence for 10 seconds as you choose to interact with the lake or to do anything at all, it's up to you. Some length of time has passed and now you head off down the path which leaves the little lake and as you walk farther, you start to hear through the forest the slow rhythmic roar of the ocean surf. You come to the edge of trees where sand dunes start and over the dunes as you climb them 
you come onto a huge ocean beach, stretching as far as the eye can see, just as the ocean stretches as far as you can see. You have to choose to walk to the left or the right on the beach. What do you choose? As you walk, you can see ahead where the water ends, a seashell, just where the water is lapping up on the sand. This seashell is about the size of a large orange. When you get near this seashell, what do you do? See the scene in your mind. You head on from where you found the seashell, but the wind off the ocean turns cold. So you take a path through the dunes and that path between the high dunes turns into a maze. The dunes are rising high above you. You turn again and again on the winding path between the dunes and you come to a large open area, a perfect circle. And an ancient stone temple is at the center of this large circular area. It's not that big. It's deserted and dead center in the temple is a stone wall in a perfect circle with a marble door of pure white. When you approach the white door, it silently swings inward and a bright light is shining everywhere from inside. You go through the door and enter a space that is pure white and glowing. The white door closes behind you. It becomes part of a white wall, so white you can't see it. You have no depth of perception. Everything is so bright white. There's no floor, there's no walls, there's no ceiling. There's just white space. You're feeling snow blind. You start to walk forward and you find that you're floating in a limitless white space. How do you feel? Put that feeling into a few descriptive words. You can say them out loud so you remember them. You remember how the white space makes you feel. Now you wake up and you are back in the outside world and you think you never dreamed at all until you find the key in your pocket. Now take a big breath and your eyes are open. Remember, remember, remember what the key was like what happened with the tiger, what the house looked like, what happened at the lake, what happened with the seashell, how you felt in the white space. Of all those incidents, which is the incident, the experience you want to return to? And which one do you feel you have unfinished business with? Perhaps it is the same incident, perhaps not. None of these things have any meaning but how you see them might have significant meaning. As pioneered by Dr. Carl Jung, some experts in the mind believe that our dreams can sometimes manifest symbolically our experiences, our personalities, our wants and our fears, sometimes. I wonder if any of these explanations of the things in your guided meditation will ring a bell with you, and if any of these interpretations that I share will make you laugh. The key represents your ambition. How did you describe your key, your ambition? Big or small? Ordinary or unusual? Modern or old fashioned? Was it made of tin or white metal or iron or gold? The tiger represents your first experience of romantic love. Were you cautious or anxious or bold, fascinated or objective or all of those? The house represents your experience of family. The house that you saw, does it ring true with your experience? Maybe, maybe not. The lake represents sensual pleasure. The sea cell represents co-workers. The white space represents death and eternity. When I played this challenge, I was a young man and my dream walk was a hoot. <laughs> I mean, my key was a foot long and it was solid gold. It's a little uh, tarnished now, later in life. And in the lake, I stripped naked and I went swimming for hours. And I won't tell you what happened with the tiger, but <laughs> with anyone who did the exercise with me, I could not get a date for a few weeks. Oh, and the seashell. 
the seashell represents coworkers. I picked up the shell and I held it to my ear for a moment and then I hurled it into the sea. So hold your speculations lightly. It's just an exercise to get you in the habit of looking on your outer life from your inner life. Now, if you have a lot of players, the first mate can put you in breakout rooms of four or so to share. But if time allows, it's good for the whole group to hear what everyone shares. And remember, like the slide says, what happens in the lifeboat stays in the lifeboat. Look, no one has to share what they dreamed, but you could share simply whether or not any of the incidents rang true for you, symbolically, without divulging any details. Look, privacy is not a problem with extroverts like myself. We want to spill our guts. You know, the one who says, um, but enough of me talking about me. What do you think of me? So clockwise in speaker view, or left to right from row to row, each player will be asked by the first mate to share what they dreamed or pass on. That is to say, pass. The first item, the key, and then the, the same cycle of everybody uh, talking about their experience for the tiger, and then everyone does the house, then the lake, then the seashell, and then finally, the white space. Look, free advice is worth every penny, and none of this content should be construed as mental health advice. Blah, blah, blah. The first mate has the helm. Enjoy each other. <laughs>